thank you. Um, thank you all for attending and taking the time to, to listen to my research. So everything I'm going to be presenting is about research we've done in my lab at New York University, Abu Dhabi. All right. Um, okay, so I, I work on multiple topics, but one of the things that are probably more suitable for today's audience, I think, is, is to focus on one line of research which talks about why humans cooperate with machines. I mean, how are we gonna, going to study that, right? So. Uh, before we can study how humans cooperate with machines, let's look at the vast literature of cooperation among humans, right? And that actually is not a very obvious question. Like, uh, why do we cooperate with each other? So actually, you might think this is such an obvious uh, thing to, to, to think about, but it, you can think of why would you give way on, on the, in the street when, uh, someone, when a stranger wants to, to go from the sideway, right? And you have, uh, you have the, the right of way, you are driving on the main road, and the stranger shows up from the side way, right? Why would you slow down to help that stranger? Is it because that stranger will remember your good deed and pay you back in the future? Like, what are the odds that this stranger would recognize your car in the future in a similar situation, right? Is this stranger a relative of yours, a friend of yours? Not at all, right? So it's quite, quite interesting why, we, why on earth we would help a stranger when uh, that stranger will never pay us back, right? So that topic of cooperation is quite fascinating and it's not that obvious why we cooperate with uh, others. So, I mean, there are many uh, papers that worked on the topic. So one of the reasons is skin selection. So if you think like from an evolutionary perspective, we uh, cooperate with people who are uh, rel our relatives, right? To promote our gene. So as uh, one person once said, I would jump in the river to save two brothers and eight cousins. So it all depends on how much of my gene is in that person's, uh, in that person, right? That's the reason why I would want to cooperate. Obvious reason, right? You want to save, save your, uh, your relatives and promote your gene. Another reason is direct reciprocity, which is just a fancy name for reputation. Uh, if I'm nice to, to Mr. X, Mr. X then is like, tells Mr. Y, and then, or Mrs. Y, and then Mrs. Y is nice to me, as a result, so I, I, I receive the reward of my uh, cooperation, not directly with the person with which I cooperated, but through others, because my reputation uh, becomes uh, uh, like I have a good reputation, so indirectly I get the fruits of my efforts for cooperation, right? So there is also, right, so I'm, indirect reciprocity is what I said. The direct reciprocity just means I'm nice to you, you're nice to me, even if, you, if you're a stranger, you're not my relative, you're gonna pay me back, say your neighbor, right? You're nice to your neighbor, your neighbor is around, and your neighbor will pay you back sometime in the future. The indirect reciprocity is what I mentioned, which is your reputation, so you might get uh, you, the fruits of your, uh, of your efforts or cooperation through a stranger whom you've never been kind to just because you have that nice repetition in the lab or work environment. And then there is, of course, group selection, like the group of uh, hunter-gatherers who are cooperative have a greater chance of survival compared to those who do not cooperate. So over time, cooperation uh, was uh, enforced or like uh, promoted. But anyway, so let's look at a classic uh, experiment that people do to help, I mean, to model cooperation. It's very hard to study cooperation, but this simple experiment actually models it in a very, very neat and concise manner. So you have uh, Mrs. Mr. Blue and Mrs. Red. So the, they are both the criminals, they've been caught, and the police now gives them four options. So the first option is uh, they say, look, if you, if you give us, if you don't cooperate with us, if you don't say, if you don't give us any evidence incriminating your partner, meaning, this would be thought of as cooperation between themselves, right? So if blue cooperates with red and never helps the authority, then both of them will, be, will get one year in prison because the police already has something to incriminate them for one year. Now, if blue gives the, the police evidence, meaning blue defects, does not cooperate, but rather defects against red, what happens is, well, the police now have more evidence against red, so red stays three years in prison. And blue walks away free as, in, as a reward for their defection, right? Uh, the same happens to red. If red gives evidence incriminating blue, she walks away free. Uh, blue gets three years in prison. 
Well, finally, if both of them give each other, I mean, give evidence incriminating the other, they both stay two years in prison. All right? Now, let's look at the very simple uh, uh, way, of, um, re way of reasoning or thinking, line of thinking that uh, is going th in their minds. Okay? The, the crucial point is that they cannot talk to each other. Okay? So let's see. So now they have four options. So blue has two options, modeled here, in, I mean, or represented in the columns, right? They cooperate by staying silent or they defect by giving evidence against the other, right? And the same for the rows represent the options for red. And here are the, payoff, uh, the payoffs or the, the, the years spent in prison. Um, yeah, so if uh, red defects and blue cooperates, meaning cooperate stays loyal or faithful to the other partner, then uh, blue gets three years, red walks away with zero. The same here, and this is the two years, right? Now, it's very simple. What would you do if you were in blues, uh, in the shoes of blue or red? What would you do? Would you, I mean, your, some of your colleagues might be around, so be careful and just <laughs> pretend at least that you would wanna be faithful to your friends. So, I mean, I, if it's me and my lovely wife is here, I, can, I guess I ha can have no choice but to say I'm going to obviously cooperate with you and not, uh, not ever think of uh, defection. So, we, me and my wife will spend one year in prison each, but it's okay. We will live happily ever after later. Okay, so let's see. So, red is, blue is now thinking, what if red cooperates with me? Let's see what are my options, right? If red cooperates with me, I have two options, right? Because red here is the represented with the row, so red goes with the upper row. Now I have to choose either cooperation, which will get me one year, or defection will get me zero. Obviously, zero is better than one, right? So I'll, if, if red cooperates, I'll probably defect and get, just get a zero. Better than one, right? Well, what if red defects against me, right? If red defects, then I have two options, either to cooperate with her, stay silent, I also get three years, but if I defect, I get two years. This basically means no matter what red does, I'm always better off defecting, right? So I'm gonna definitely defect. I don't need to even think what red is going to do. Regardless, I'm always better off. Zero is better than one, two is better than three. So I'm going to defect, right? Well, red, thinks in the same way exactly and realizes very quickly that it's better for me to defect regardless of what the blue does. So as a result, what happens is that both of them defect and both of them get the worst outcome for the group, which is four years, right? Look here, the total here is like two years, total spent by the group, three and three, and the worst outcome is four. So this is uh, called the prisoner's dilemma. Why, because it, why is it such a dilemma? Because you think very logically, you're rationalizing, yet you're pre the predicted outcome, which is called Nash equilibrium in this case, is for both to get the worst outcome. How can a mathematical, logical uh, analysis lead to the worst possible outcome, right? And you can look at it, the math is correct, everything is correct. So what they're missing, if you think what went wrong, what went wrong is this lack of faith between them with each other. That cannot be modeled. That's the thing that will save you in such a situation. You have faith in that the partner will be faithful to me. I have to be faithful to them. I have long-term uh, repercussions to think about. Maybe if I defect now, they're going to uh, murder me in the future. All of these things are not m captured here. This is why humans are so much better at this cooperation than machines, right? Well, anyway. So what happens when you put people against each other in an experiment? This, I mean, countless uh, papers have been uh, written on the topic. So you get strangers, they don't get to talk to each other through a screen maybe online. You get them to play multiple rounds, right? So when you have multiple rounds, now you have to think of the next time I interact with this person. It's like defecting against your neighbor. You will see that neighbor tomorrow, the day after, and the day after. So you, you think if I'm, not, if I'm mean today, well, I'm gonna suffer in the future. So when you introduce multiple rounds, what happens? This is typical. So if you see here, the proportion of actions that are involve cooperation is, is it? It decreases a little bit. It's less, uh, a bit more than 40%. This is typical over the 50 rounds, right? But, uh, but this is still quite a lot of cooperation for, for uh, given the fact that cooperation is the worst possible outcome if you would, were to think logically and you know, mathematically about it. So this is quite good. So anyway, so what we did, we studied this cooperation when we put a machine on the other side. And uh, well, we were inspired by this book. 
Um, if in case for those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Beautiful uh, book, still a classic. I think it was written quite a long time ago, but it's uh, absolutely uh, captivating and really fun to read. Uh, over 30 million copies. Uh, one of the times uh, 100 most influential books of all time. How to influence and influence people. So what we did, we wrote a paper published in uh, AAAI, the top, top AI conference in the world, and says how machines win friends and influence people. And here are the first four authors, and the first is my PhD student, and um, uh, me and, my, and the other advisor. So how does it work? Well, in each round, uh, players could communicate with each other. In our setup, unlike the prisoner's dilemma, they can uh, communicate with each other. But the important thing is that the communication is not binding. What does this mean? It means we get to talk and I can say, I promise you, if you cooperate, I promise you, I'll, I will definitely cooperate. I can still defect. So I can make pro false uh, promises and it's not binding. But they can talk to each other, okay? Now, for the algorithm, we had to think how do we put, uh, what do we put inside the algorithm? In terms of how the algorithm is thinking, like because here they can communicate. Let's first look at how they, they think. What's the strategy in the algorithm? Uh, there are two state-of-the-art algorithms that are particularly suitable for this uh, setup. Uh, so we experimented with both. They're called S++ and I, uh, AAA. And what does the algorithm say? Wh what it says, what we did is we designed four personas. One is called Spoke, Beef, Carnegie, and Thumper, which we're gonna see in a minute, right? So the algorithm has inside it two components. One is how, to, how does it decide the next action, cooperate or defect in each round? And what does it say? And these are different, two different things, right? Well, in terms of Spoke, inspired by this character, Spoke, uh, which just states facts, just states facts, emotionless, right? The, the classic robot you can think of. Well, Carnegie is inspired by Carnegie's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The, the sentences that are said by the algorithm follow the rules of Car Carnegie, Dale Carnegie, things like never criticize, condemn, or complain, talk in terms of the other person's interest, give sincere appreciation. The third persona is Thumper, which has the non-Thumper rule. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. So remain silent, doesn't say a single thing. And finally, we have Biff from uh, Back to the Future, the opposite of Carnegie. Always criticize, condemn, and complain. Talk in terms of your own interests and take credit. It's the success is mine, right? So let's see examples. Here are the encoded texts. We had like lots of texts in different uh, situations. And the algorithm basically based on its inner state selects which of those uh, to, to, uh, to uh, represent. So, Stoke uh, says, uh, what was it called? Yes, Spoke, I meant. Yes, Spoke says, uh, I don't accept your proposal. Fact, emotionless. Dale Carnegie, well, good proposal. If you show that you are trustworthy, I will consider accepting it in the future. Um, and then, like Biff, you're sleazy, can't trust you, and obviously Thumper says nothing. Well, here are the results. Winning friends, influencing people. Winning friends was like measured by a post-experiment survey. Did you like the algorithm and so on? Influencing people is just basically the percentage of cooperation. If the algorithm is very influential, it can influence the opponent to cooperate more, right? And well, the two algorithms that we see are the blue and the red depicted here. So some things that are very interesting to see here is that Thumper is the least influential even compared to the bully. Like even the bully, can motivate people to cooperate more than an algorithm that says nothing. That's very interesting, right? So look at this, like uh, the more you go to the right, the more, the, more, um, uh, the, mo the more up you go, the more influential you are, right? And we can see that Biff is much higher than Thumper, right? In, in, be it with the red algorithm or the blue algorithm. Always Biff is higher, meaning Biff can influence people more. Like uh, people can be bullied into cooperation. Like even if you're silent, you may not do as well as an algorithm that bullies people. Very interesting. Another thing we can see is S++ is more influential than EEE. So you can see that the, the blue is always more influential than the red, okay, regardless of the persona. And obviously the last thing is that regardless of the algorithm, blue or red, Carnegie is always the uh, 
most, the most trusted, the most, uh, and the one that wins friends the most. So Carnegie was right in that his rules indeed can win friends and influence people, even if an, a machine follows those rules. Um, we did look very quickly at something called this literature of explainable AI, where you explain to people why uh, the algorithm took the decision it took. And here, if you look at the, just the S++ algorithm, you can see like what happens without explainable AI and with explainable AI. So with explainable AI, it's much, much higher. So people are much more likely to be influenced and to, 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 to be satisfied as like with the measure of friendship uh, if the algorithm says why uh, did it make the decisions it, it made. Um, all right, so this is one line of research. Now let's see, I'll tell you uh, another line of research which is similar, which is inspired by this video here. So this video was, uh, went viral. This is uh, Google CEO presenting his technology about uh, voice, um, like the, the voice uh, assistant, which uh, it's called Google Duplex, which can speak almost like, almost like a perfect human using uh, deep learning and all that. Fascinating technology, right? So let's have a look. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a hacker appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule an appointment for you. Let's listen. Is the audio good? Is louder? Uh, yeah, good. Okay. This is Google Duplex talking now. The, the AI saying, mm hmm. Obviously, this is interesting because, it, uh, no, let me just uh, exit. Yeah, this is interesting because, um, because it doesn't make sense for a machine to say things like, mm, uh -huh. the, the machine takes a millisecond to decide what it's gonna say next. So to just say things like, mm, like pretending to be hesitant the way humans do, that's all just to make, give you that illusion or impression that you're talking to a real uh, a person. And the person on the other side of the phone call was not even aware that they were talking to a machine. Fascinated, us computer scientists like myself were like fascinated by the technological advancement. Well, but guess what happened? What, uh, what happened is the Washington Post, a Google program can pass as a human on the phone. Should it be required to tell people it's a machine? Oh, ethical dilemma, right? Well, okay. Google grapples with horrifying reaction to uncanny AI te te technology. This is the Guardian. Google's deceitful AI assistant uh, to identify itself as a robot during calls. So what happens is that people thought of this as completely unethical because the person on the other side is not even aware. So you're like kind of deceiving me and I, I'm now like, uh, I ha I ha you don't have the right to deceive me knowing that you're going to deceive me. So Google was forced, actually, in the end, Google, after like a few weeks, deceive its full AI, is to identify itself as a robot. So they decided to, to change it and say, okay, hi, I'm a robot, I'm about to deceive you into thinking that I'm a human, please. Could, what's the point, right? Once you, you cannot, once you know this fact, you cannot unknow it, right? So it's an ethical dilemma. Do we allow machines to, to, to fool us if we don't, then there is no coming back, right? So also here, Google AI Assistant must identify itself as a robot during phone calls. And here we have uh, the Verge. Google now says controversial AI voice calling system will identify itself as human. So this is just some of the media coverage. All right, so, so what did we do? We experimented, we did an experiment. 
So here's the experiment. You have this participant, and the participant is going to play iterated prisoner's dilemma, what, we, what we've seen before, the 50 rounds of prisoner's dilemma experiment. And they're going to, so who they think they're playing with. So there are two groups, right? Some of them who think they're playing with a human. Others think they're playing with a bot. Look at that cute bot with the antenna. Now, who they were really playing with. So some of those who played with the humans were really playing with the humans. Some of those who thought they were playing with the humans were in fact playing with a bot, right? And the same for those who were given information that you're now going to play with a bot. Half of them were really actually playing with a bot. The other half was, uh, was in fact playing with a human. And this setup uh, leads us to four different combinations, right? So let's see what happens. Well, what happens is that uh, people cooperate when the information is human, people cooperate more, right? Re rather than when the information is bot. And this is like when, this is the proportion of uh, cooperations when the opponent is an actual bot. So when you are playing with a bot, if I am telling you, if you think this bot is a human, you will cooperate more, right? Then what happens if you're playing with a human? So here it says on the top, it says associate is a bot, like your partner is a bot, the one you're playing with. So when your partner or associate is human, again, if you're given the information that you're playing with a human, you will cooperate much more than if you are given information that you're playing with a bot. So regardless of what the opponent is doing, you'll always cooperate more if you think that you are playing with a, with a bot, I mean with a human. So conclusion is bots may compromise their efficiency if they disclose their non-human nature. So maybe Google, I mean, maybe the interesting thing is that maybe you will be more comfortable if you are fooled into thinking you're talking to a human, which is interesting, right? So suppose, for example, it's known that people have this bias against uh, surgeons and like when it comes to any medical diagnosis, people trust a human uh, doctor more, even if the machine learning algorithm has access to like literally 10,000 times more data. People just trust humans more in certain things. So maybe a patient who's like fooled into thinking they're getting the diagnosis from a human may themselves be happier, right? So this now is a dilemma, right? What do we do? So this led to this beautiful art which we designed with an artist which is showing you that the, when, when, hum, when the bots are posing as humans, you get like good response from the customer. And when they are revealing their non-human nature, well, pe the people are not happy. And, uh, okay, there is some other thing which I'm thinking, I, I can skip for now, but what happens is that for media coverage, the paper was published in uh, Nature Machine Intelligence, the, the most prestigious paper. I think I might, arguably, it's probably the first paper to make it to Nature Machine Intelligence, maybe in the whole region. And it even made the cover of the November issue. So this is the cover of Nature Machine Intelligence uh, representing our study, and got covered by Boston Globe, Nature Asia, uh, Scientific Americans and Wired, and many others. So this is one paper. Um, I'm going to talk about some other line of uh, research that's a bit similar in terms of the cooperation, but this one has even more pictures, so hopefully we'll keep you engaged. So just very quickly, so here's another line of research we're currently working on, wrapping up. So you have here, imagine you have the x-axis representing how similar the, the robot is to a human, right? And on the y-axis, how much, how pleasant you feel when you are interacting with that uh, robot, right? So let's see. So when the robot, suppose here, as at the, in the, at the leftmost point of this, uh, the, of the x-axis, you have the, the, the phone, which doesn't look like a human at all, right? But the more you move to the right, the more the, the robot starts to look a bit like a human. So this, this has an arm, which is similar to humans. This here is another robot, which now it has a head, right? Starting to look more similar to a human. And you can see that we, are, we feel, this is non a known result, we feel more pleasant or happier or more comfortable when we are interacting with a robot that looks more like a human. So if we make the robot now has arms and heads, even more human-like, we feel happier even, right? And this here robot, you can see that it starts to look really close to a human. And you'd expect, obviously, that when we have a robot that looks perfectly like a human, like a perfect human, like a, the Blade Runner movie, you will be like feeling very pleasant I mean, feelings. You'll be, you'll be happy to interact with such a robot the most, right? But what happens is this very interesting phenomenon called the uncanny valley. So this is the uncanny valley. What happens in this valley is that people have noticed 
that when the robot is almost human, but not yet there, you start to feel creeped out. So you can, you, I think you cannot argue that this robot looks a bit more human than the one to the left, and less human to the one to the right, right? So compared to the left, it's a bit more like a toy, but this one starts to have realistic eyes, and you cannot help but feel like creepy, right? Something is like, why is this robot looking so, so creepy? Well, the reason is this robot is, um, yeah, I mean, now you start your evolutionary way of thinking is kicking in, and you're thinking, okay, this is a human that looks almost like us, but different, you start to feel uncomfortable, right? So, so look at these. These are examples of uncanny, the uncanny valley. I mean, they're almost there, but God, are they creepy and freak, freaking horrifying, right? So, like, they're smiling, they're trying to be nice, but uh, it doesn't work. So what did we do? Well, here's what we did. So we've, we've looked at a few of our lovely uncanny uh, robots. Uh, you, can, you can look at them, right? Look at them, almost there. But, so what we did with using deep learning, we made them human. Look at this. It's exactly the same person. We just stripped out that creepiness and left everything else the same. So these are people who do not exist. What we did, we generated the pictures to the right increasingly more human, right? So the right, uh, the rightmost of this spectrum looks absolutely convincing, like a real human, right? And what we did well, manually using like a graphic editor, we made them less human to, to the left, thereby resulting in this spectrum where we are increasing gradually the robot's uh, likeness, human-like uh, features. So, so what we did, now we experimented with the, with the with them, first of all, asking people, like asking participants, do you think that these robots are increasingly becoming a human, and how pleasant do you find it to, to interact with them? So this, this satisfies these two conditions, because the, that spectrum, uh, indeed, it's supposed to become more and more human-like as we go from left to right, and we are supposed to see that valley, and this spectrum indeed reproduces this phenomenon. We, look at, we evaluated the other spectrum, and yes, it does increase as it becomes more human-like on the top, but you do not see a deep valley deep enough, so that wasn't good for our experiments. Then there is this one, well, you see a valley at the bottom, but this does not seem more human than, it's not increasingly human. There is that dip, which is not supposed to happen. This one looks good also. No, no this one also doesn't have a valley, so it's not good enough. And finally, this one was good. It is on the top, it is increasingly human. On the bottom, you see the valley. But we decided to go with the first because it has the deepest valley. And now we go to our uh, games, just like the game that we measure uh, cooperation. There is a game that measures trust. And we can see that there is indeed a valley. People cooperate or trust le least the, uh, the robot with, uh, with the uncanny face. However, when it comes to the cooperation, there is no such uh, dip. And if we look at this, this spectrum, this is a spectrum between like agency and experience. Maybe I can skip that for the interest of time. And I'll skip these. I think that's the end of our experiment, so that's work being done. I'll just present very quickly uh, some, one last thing, which is some of the very quick lines of research, uh, other research that I do in my lab. One of them is this one, which is how do you hide people in a social network? This work was published in Nature Human Behavior, which is you know, the, the top human behavior, human behavior journal in the world. And uh, in this, what we try to do is we try to hide groups within a social network from AI. So this is a very different line of research where AI can look at your Facebook profile and figure out so many things about you, much, much more than just what you put on Facebook, right? So you can put like just your friends on Facebook and suddenly the AI knows who are your, uh, who are, which groups you belong to, because there are these community detection algorithms, and can know which, who are your friends who you did not declare on Facebook. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, is this person your friend, friend suggestion, and they get it right, right? But the, the question is, well, I did not declare this person as my friend. How did you know that this is my friend? This is something I did not declare, meaning I do not want anyone to know. But the algorithm is so smart, it can know even the things you do not declare. Well, there are ways to hide these algorithms to preserve your, uh, your private information, whether it's the friends you do not declare on Facebook. If you want Facebook to never guess them, there is an algorithm to do it. We publish that. 
And if you belong to a group and you're afraid, say, to be subjected to prejudice and you don't want to be known as a member of certain group because of some, maybe this group is not, not accepted in, a, in, a, in some country where there is some maybe, not, there isn't like, say, political freedom. It's up to you to declare if you're a member of a group. But if you want to hide that, well, we have a way to do it. And um, there is this other line of research, the last one, because we also do things that are not AI. One of them is we're studying editorial boards, and uh, we found that there is a major uh, underrepresentation of women among all editors in almost all journals. This is a very different line of research. So you can see here that the women in the green bar among scientists is only 25%, which is definitely underrepresentation. But for editors, it's like 14%, the blue bar. And for editors in chief, it's less than 10%. Less than 10% of editors in chief are women. And this underrepresentation has been happening over the five, past five decades because those three lines, if there is equality, they should be at the 50%. But they're not, right? They're increasing, but they're not. And you can see this whole underrepresentation in many disciplines. So I just thought of giving you like a quick promotion. And uh, the last thing I want to say is that all of this would not have been possible had it not been for my wife, Sheza, who's sitting right over there. So thank you, Sheza, for your support. <laughs>